Hello, everyone. Again, this is Ethan Shapiro, the climate change realtor with Coldwell Banker, founder and manager of the most innovative real estate sales company, here for another episode of Changing the Climate. I am very lucky to have my guest, Mr. Joshua Anisko. Joshua is the founder and CEO of Pangea Organics, a skin and body care company recognized for its leadership in creating premium quality formulations born from the marriage of pure ingredients and high integrity sourcing. Joshua, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. It's great to be here. Cool, cool, cool. Do you want to just start by giving us a little background about who you are and, got, and how you got to be where you are today? Yeah, I, uh, I've been in the skincare health and well-being space for about 20 years. Um, I started making bar soap here in Boulder, Colorado 20 years ago, built a pretty large uh, organic bar soap factory, and then uh, got into skin and body care uh, formulation and really just set out to kind of be a pivotal change in how we look at the things that we put on and in our body and sourcing organic uh, ingredients, but also really focusing on the efficacy of how we can use organic ingredients to improve our overall, overall well-being. Cool. So what, what made you want to change the industry? Do you think there were some problems with it before you got into there? Or I'm sure there's always problems, but yeah. <laughs> there's always problems. Um, yeah. You know, when I got into the industry, I started looking at what was on the market and realized the vast majority of things that people are buying to put on their body are highly toxic. And so a lot of people think, well, I buy all my stuff at, you know, X, Y, and Z stores. It's all natural. But the reality is, even if you think you're buying all natural products, you're putting on dozens of chemicals that are known to be carcinogenic on your body uh, daily. And uh, these, these add up, you know, one product might have four ingredients, but I think the average American uses 14 products a day and that's average. Some people use far more than that. And uh, when you talk to people, they're usually like, well, I'm a pretty simple person and I only use a couple products. I'm like, well, you took a shower, you brush your teeth, you shampoo, you use deodorant, you maybe use a fragrance, blah, 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 blah. And by the time I go through a regimen with someone who's quote unquote, simple. <laughs> I've counted up, you know, 40, 50 chemicals that they're putting on their body a day. And, and those are just what's listed on the ingredients. 70% of, of companies actually don't list all of their ingredients on the inky, which is the, the, uh, nom the international nomenclature for cosmetic ingredients. That's the ingredient panel on yeah. the back of products you're using. Yeah. How did you first get interested in, in this stuff? Do you have, is there some sort of personal connection? Um, I dropped out of school when I was 15 and started working and traveling around the world. And before I was moving to India in 1999, I went home to visit my mother who was convinced I was never coming back. And uh, she had <laughs> bought a coffee table book, uh, how to make handmade soap. And I didn't know what soap was made out of. And I went out and bought all the ingredients and surprised her and made a batch of soap. And I ended up traveling for two years. And after two years, I realized I wanted to start a company and I really liked the idea of making something that is useful. Um, you know, especially during these times of being in a pandemic, uh, sure. people have realized how, how important a simple thing like soap is. 100%. And, you know, I've been saying for the past six months that finally, people are washing their hands because <laughs> most people just don't wash their hands. You know, you go into a public That's restroom. That's hard for me to believe. Yeah. I mean, pre pandemic, you go into a public restroom at, you know, a grocery store or an airport and 50% uh, of guys don't wash their hands. Wow. <laughs> I know? mean, I guess as I'm a, definitely not one of them. <laughs> yeah. As a soap maker, you just become very aware of how horrible our hygiene is. And so yeah. it's been Great to see that people are finally recognizing the importance of um, good hand hygiene. No kidding. So you mentioned that there's a lot of harsh chemicals in the products we use. Why, why do you think that is? You think it's because of like cost effectiveness or just because they're, I mean, I really, I really don't know much about this area at all. Why, why are there harmful chemicals being sold to people consistently? Yeah, it's definitely because of cost. So in, you know, in the 1950s, 
the first synthetic surfactants were created at Procter and Gamble, uh, like sodium sulfate, cocomidal propyl betaine, cocomide DEA, and these surfactants replaced soap. So soap is made of from saponifying fats with an alkali. So modern day times, it's usually plant fats and um, sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, and that creates a saponification process. But when you're using plant oils, it's definitely several times more expensive than synthesizing a surfactant. Mm -hmm. And a surfactant is just a surface active agent. So it's a, an elongated acronym and it's what foams up and lifts dirt and oil and germs and bacteria off your skin and washes it down the drain. Um, but the reality is, you know, if you think about synthetic surfactants, that they're not only toxic for us, they're extremely toxic for the environment because it's just destroying the safety of our water. Um, millions and mil billions of people using synthetic surfactants a day and it goes into the drain, which inevitably oh ends up in our earth. Where did your, your interest for planetary health kind of originate? Or how did you kind of figure out that you wanted to be a, a, a cause for good when it comes to this kind of stuff? I think early on when I, when I first started creating soaps, it was more about creating innovative, good smelling products that were just felt yep. good. And after the first few years, when I really got into the industry, I realized how toxic it was. And I was like, okay, I can actually create innovative products that smell good, but there's a need for transparency in our industry. People, you know, 20 years later, even though people think the, or the natural organic body care industry is big, it's actually like tiny, tiny, because most people are using products they think are safe and they think are natural because of the packaging. Mm -hmm. Brands do a really amazing job of making the packaging just make the natural green like or picture of a leaf. Go off. Yeah, like the picture of a leaf or a farm. Or, I mean, the amount or of forest. truly organic products that are on the market is this minuscule. And yeah. we're all friends. <laughs> you know, all the people <laughs> that are making organic products actually know each other because we have this common bond that we're like, this is what we're here to do. And even though the media seems to think this industry has exploded, it's actually pretty small. No kidding. What are like the long-term measurable negative consequences of dumping all these chemicals into our water supply? I mean, you know, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. I mean, sure. the, uh, our water is toxic. Our yeah. water supply is toxic, um, not only from the products we're using, but from the packaging that uh, is holding the products. You know, there's we, the we literally can't take a sip of water anymore without uh, ingesting plastic. In fact, scientists are now saying every week we consume a credit card of plastic. A week? Because I had had a someone week. on the show a couple weeks ago who had said it was like a year. That's a crazy yeah. visual to really think about. It's nuts. It's nuts. Yeah. We contribute 23,000 jumbo jets of plastic a year into the ocean. And if you sit there and just think about jumbo, jumbo jets, jets just crashing into the ocean that are made of plastic garbage, you would never get to the end. 23,000 jumbo jets of plastic. A year. A year. And this all started in like, you know, plastic didn't exist until I think 1928. Isn't and, that I remember growing up in the 80s that, you know, ketchup and mustard used to come in glass and you would, you know, get it yeah. out. And all of a sudden, all these ads came out. Well, you don't have to do it anymore. It's now squeezable. and Everything's squeezable and easy and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and the industry created what I call the blue bin lie. The petroleum industry said, oh, don't worry about the plastic. You just throw it in this blue bin and it turns into another product. But it was all lies. Only 7% of plastic ever gets recycled. And it can only be recycled twice. Wow. So, so inevitably, if, if, all of this plastic ends up in the garbage. That's, in the ocean. That's terrible. And, and you, you, it makes you wonder, like, what are we being lied to about today? If it's, you know, it's taken so many years to figure this out. No, I mean, we're being lied to about everything. <laughs> I'm just talking yeah. about plastic. <laughs> yeah. No. We try to keep a positive attitude. So um, 
how did um what did it look like for for when you first started Pangea Organics to uh, where we are today? So for the first you know fifteen years, it was all about um, creating clean products, mm -hmm. and for the past couple of years, it's been about uh, getting rid of the plastic. And so Alpine Provisions, which is a very new brand, which is under the Pangea umbrella, uh, this week is going 100% plastic free. Amazing. Uh, it took 18 months to do this. And it has been an incredible journey of really understanding how big the plastic problem is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been on a plant-based diet for close to 25 years. And Cheers. it started because of animal welfare and animal rights. Mm -hmm. And today, you know, I say to people, I'm like, look, my understanding now is if it's not plastic free, I don't consider it vegan. I don't consider it cruelty free because plastic is killing tens of millions of animals a year. That's and so even you know, Pangea is not plastic free yet. It will be in about six months. So me as an animal rights activist, I cannot wake up in the morning and say that Pangea is cruelty free or vegan because it's not. Um, and now it's like my goal is to take all of our brands plastic free and not by 2025 or 2030 or 2045, like a lot of these bigger brands are saying, it's this year. It's, it's just gotta I stop. Like once, once I had the realization of how much destruction is causing, I can't, <laughs> I can't keep continuing to produce what I know is wrong. And as an innovator and as a founder, my job is to be a steward for the fringe that predicts the future. And if I wake up in the morning and I truly believe in that, it has to happen right now. Because, you know, these brands that come out and say, oh, by 2030, like Coca-Cola, by 2030, we're going to cut plastic by 20%. Number one, it's a lie because these big brands throw out these numbers of these future dates that no one ever remembers. And it never happens, right? I mean, it, it and it's also like, as a consumer, how do you hold these multinational companies to the fire? You can't. Like, because it's not by their product. Well, yeah. And that's what I always tell people. I was like, you know what? It makes At a big difference. Day, consumers have the vote. Consumers have the vote. Consumers control how our world evolves. If 100%. you do not believe in something, do not buy it, period and those companies will cease to exist. Yeah. And I think the plastic thing is such a huge deal right now because plastic is the one thing we're doing in our environment that's like every time you use something in plastic and you throw it away, you cannot get that back. It's in mm. the environment. Yeah. And so, you know, it starts with our food. We have turned into a culture of faster prepared right now need it throw it in the oven it you know just like prime now <laughs> everything's plastic 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 because it's easier it's cheaper it's faster and i think that we have to come to a place where we value the future of our planet the future of our safety the future of our water supply over faster cheaper now it's it's really hard to get people to i mean the most the most beautiful thing in the world is delayed gratification you know you who is an entrepreneur you understand this you had an idea and you've worked really hard to bring it to reality i think it's really hard to get someone to be like if you sacrifice today we'll have amazing things 10 years from now how can we communicate that to people cuz they they people want people won't even wait 10 minutes to get something they want it right now they want a right text now. they want a, a like how can we communicate this this vision to people that you're you're kind of throwing your future away for the present yeah it's 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 kind of amazing and it, it's hard explaining to people because it's not in your face and i always tell people i'm like look if you want to see how bad the plastic problem is Pacific all you have to do is patch. All you have, well, you can't see it though, right? I mean, is it under the water? You, well, I mean, how many people are going to be able to get in a boat and go out there and see it? Sure, if they were, went out there in a <laughs> boat, they would see it. But I say, people, say to people, try to live in your house without throwing away your garbage for one month. And when I say not throwing away, I don't mean put it in the garage or in the basement. I mean, actually leave it in your kitchen. 
leave it in your kitchen for one month and you will see how massive the problem is. The problem is we created this culture where we just put it in a bag and then we put it outside and then someone takes it away and where does it go? I don't know. It goes in this big hole with these, these tractors and they bury it and da, 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 or, or even better, we have this idea that it gets recycled because recycled is such a beautiful word. <laughs> it's actually a lie. Only aluminum and glass can be recycled. Everything else is downcycled, best case scenario. What's actually happening is 93% of plastic is ending up in our environment. 93%. That is startling. And I wanted to touch on what you had said before that you had said if something doesn't come in a, if it comes in a plastic container, you wouldn't consider it vegan. So I, I've been eating plant based for, I want to say, so 2016. So a little over four years or so now. And nice. I'm really, thank you. Yeah, no, well, you, I was, what I was also going to thinking is that 25 years, like talking about not buying Coca-Cola, if you don't support the brand, like you have personally changed the world, but I know, I, you know, most people I know have four to five meals uh, and more than that, probably 10 to 15 meals of, of meat every single, every single week and 25 years of you not having five, you know, whatever I said, 10 to 20 meals of meat a week, it, it totally changes the industry. It really does make a huge difference. I don't think people realize it's like, Oh, if I just stopped, even like the meatless Monday can make such a big difference. You know huge. what I mean? Just, huge. Yeah. Cause the, the, cause a business needs to, to make profit. So they'll, they'll keep track of how much inventory is, is going out the door. So if less people eat it, they'll, they'll produce less. And, I really think people should understand that. But what I wanted to, to ask you is as, as someone who's very into exercise, I go to the gym five times a week, very, and I, I have this um, orgain organic protein powder. I consume a lot of that every single week and it comes in this big giant plastic, plastic tub. tub. Can, can, I, can I actually, I can see, can I go grab it real quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I've seen this brand. Yeah, so they actually just changed the container. So here, here's the old container that they use. Yeah. I don't know if I'm, am I allowed to like, yeah, I'm allowed to say whatever I want. Here's the old <laughs> container. And like, here's the, the new container. So you can, and if, I don't know if you can tell people who are it's listening, you can't smaller. tell. It's a little bit smaller. And what they said was, it says, um, same servings, smaller container, greater sustainability, less corrugated packaging, less plastic. Um, I, I would bring, I, I brought that up and that's interesting. They just changed. It was just the last month they changed the size, but as, as someone who needs a lot of protein, what, what would you recommend? I do like forgetting this. I, I, cause I have thought about this, like getting, I'm getting all these plastic tubs every single month. How, what's a sustainable way for me to get this, this protein from a company like this? What's, what's the other yeah, option? So, I mean, I mean, the, pro I work out a lot as well and I used to take protein powder. I don't anymore. I just basically came down to, you know what, if I spend the time to actually understand my diet mm -hmm. and, and eliminate fillers, then I'm going to get all the protein I need. You know, like yeah. I, I'm, I weigh 210 pounds. I'm six one and I, I eat a lot. I love eating and I exercise a lot. And I've, over the years, I have figured out the, the right combination of foods so that I don't need supplemental protein. That being said, you know, I went into, like, I do take supplements and I, I found that there are brands like Solgar, which have plastic free packaging. They, I don't think they did it intentionally. It was just the brand has been that way forever. They have a glass bottle with an aluminum cap. And cool. so when I look at that, I was like, okay, so this brand's doing it. Every supplement company could be doing this. There's nothing in the way. And it's like, when I look at things like Tamari and toasted sesame seed oil, things that I like buying, like Udi's 369, like things that I consume, all they have to really do is remove like the little stupid plastic plug, the pore spout, the orifice reducer, Mm -hmm. And their product's plastic free, but it's going to take consumers asking for it. I've been watching it happen right. in the pasta, pasta world. You know, it's like we have these boxes of pasta with a plastic window. It's just been the way pasta has been sold since like the 1980s. <laughs> Why can't you just print the picture of the pasta on the box? So companies uh, have now. Barilla 
is removing yeah. all plastic windows by next year. Jovial removed their plastic window with a cellulose backyard compostable window. And that obviously came from consumers saying, hey, like, just get rid of the plastic. We love your product, get rid of the plastic. We don't need it, it's not needed. You can do better. It doesn't really cost any more money, probably saves you money. But consumers have to ask brands to do this. And as a vegan, I, I am now like on the platform of saying to the vegan industry, hey, in 25 years, it is incredible the movement that has happened moving away from animal-based proteins. Now all of these vegan products that have built billion dollar brands, $100 million brands, $10 million brands, $5 million brands, get out of the plastic. It's all, it's all packaged in plastic, all this vegan product. Mm -hmm. And so it's not me pointing the finger, it's me saying like, hey, we've created an amazing industry, now let's actually get rid of the plastic. What are your thoughts on the, the faux meat and the lab grown meat and these, these substitutes for meat? I take it you're someone who probably just doesn't eat any of that stuff and eats plant-based food altogether. Am I right? Yes. I mean, every once in a while, if I'm at a restaurant and they have right. like a Beyond Burger on the menu and everyone else is eating, I'll eat it. Um, but I have this thing called the vegan veto. And <laughs> I say to my friends that own restaurants, uh, you know, 15% of people that go to a restaurant want plant-based options. That's 1.5 out of 10 customers. So if you don't have really good plant-based options on your menu, you are failing as a business because- and it's an increasing not, percentage as well. It's increasing, but in, in, you know, it used to be, oh, but we, you know, we, we can make anything vegan. That's not what we want to hear. We don't want to hear we can make anything vegan because that to me is saying you don't, you don't give a shit about us. You mm -hmm. are, you know, I have to be that person like, can you remove this? Can you remove that? I don't want to be that guy. What I want to go is to a restaurant and I want to support local, local restaurants and say, oh, they thought about me. They have tasty, healthy, well-balanced um, vegan options on the menu. The vegan veto is this, and you, you have probably experienced this in the past 10 years or the last four years you've been vegan. Your friends want to go out to eat. Four years, yeah. Four years. They always, I bet a million bucks, they ask you because you're the vegan where you want to go eat. I hate it. My I, friends, don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get involved ever. I just want it to be done. I want them to just decide and not consider me at all. I hate it so much. <laughs> well, so for my friends, they know that I'm plant-based. So they say, Hey, where do you want to go eat? So guess what? I don't go to the restaurants that don't have vegan food. So that's the vegan veto. It's not mm -hmm. just me now. It's me and my four friends or me and my six friends or me and my one friend. Well, you're We're an influencer going to those restaurants. of your friends. <laughs> Where I'm the influencer and guess what? Of the tens of millions of vegans in this country, mm -hmm. there are hundreds of vegan vetoes every year. And so That's as a, a shout out point. to all the restaurants, if you are, do not have amazing vegan options on your menu, you are losing millions of customers, guaranteed. That is my clip for this episode, for sure. I like that. Um, so let's transition a little bit to, to your company. And um, where how about how important it is of where you source your ingredients because I, I understand you there's a lot of conscientiousness that goes into that um how how have you developed these relationships with local producers and how does it work from kind of getting the ingredients in the door to like having the product come out well i i never claim local ingredients because there's nothing local about our ingredients it's impossible to source interesting ingredients locally for a skin and body care company. Anybody that's telling you that is just, it's kind of like the small batch handmade. <laughs> There's no yeah. such thing as, unless you're on Etsy and you're literally at home making stuff with your hands. That's what my mom's doing. Yeah. And which is amazing. <laughs> but if you go to a store and you see a bottle with like a printed label and it says small batch, you know, handmade, it's like my bullshit meter goes off. <laughs> Um, our products are made, you know, in a facility with vats and filling machines. And what we do is we make sure we're telling our customers every single ingredient that's in our products. Mm -hmm. We make sure that none of our ingredients are known carcinogens. We make sure that we always source organic whenever possible. And the reason why is if you are not buying organic, 
it's really saying yes to highly toxic agricultural processes. And what I mean is, if it's not certified organic, what does that those, mean? That then certified organic? Yeah. It means that they're grown without synthetic petroleum based fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides, and insecticides. Is that's there all more that to means. it? That's just, that's all it means. Okay. Right now, that's what organic certified means, and in that it's being processed in a facility that's certified organic. But the most important part is. If you have never visited a farm that is not organic, go visit one. You walk into the field and you're literally standing on inches of fertilizer, nitrogen, synthetic, petroleum-based fertilizer. They have giant planes that come and dust the fields with pesticides and fungicides and herbicides. So do you want to feed that to your family? Do you want to give that to your child? Do you want to put that on your body in the shower? Fuck no. It's disgusting. Mm. It's like yeah. mind-bogglingly disgusting. It's what new, isn't it? Food. Well, like it's only the last 50 years, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's new-ish, but that is how our food is made. You know, if you want to get a firsthand experience of it, um, watch uh, the new movie, the new documentary, Kiss the Earth, or Chris, Kiss the Ground, I think it's called. And you can really see like, there are people in hazmat suits <laughs> spraying pesticides on the food that we put in our bodies. So they have a hazmat suit on, protect them from the chemicals that they're spraying on our food. And so it's the same thing in my industry. It's like, I'm not going to buy something that is sprayed with toxins and wake up in the morning and sell it to people as a health product. Just not. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't yeah. make any sense for us, and it's even more horrible for the planet because all of those pesticides, all of those herbicides, all of those fungicides and nitrogen-based fertilizers are ending up in our water. We are drinking them every day. You cannot drink a glass of water on Earth right now in any like populated area without ingesting pesticides and herbicides and fungicides. That's about, disgusting. I mean, yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the skin and body care industry in general? Like your, your perspective on it? Like how did it get to where it is today? And how can we move it forward? Like, like you said, this year, like, like how, how can we make changes today? Because there's people, people are not, I wouldn't even say addicted. People need their products. They use it every single day. Some people have yeah. probably been using the same product that's bad for their skin for, for yep. a decade or more. What can we yeah. do to, to change it and how, from where it is now? Well, I always say there's products you need and there's products you want. So the products you need are basically like soap. Yep. <laughs> Everything yeah. else is the product you want, right? So there are things that you need, which are soap and toothpaste, maybe shampoo, maybe you could say a body oil lotion. Everything else is want. So like most people don't use eye cream and facial cleansers and face creams and masks and scrubs. So, so what I, you know, what Maybe I explain to people is 90%, and this is someone who makes a living selling skincare, 90% of your skin health is what you put in your body. It True. is not the products you put on your face. Yeah, it's what you eat, 90%. But we as a culture developed kind of this industry called the skincare industry that uses generally fear and guilt and like negative marketing to make you think that you need this eye cream or you're going to have wrinkles and da 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 all this stuff. It's 10% of what your skin looks like. 10%. Where do you get that? What really if, well, it's science. What really, it, what really is affecting your skin is negative attitude, stress, anxiety, inflammatory foods, sugar, salt, too much fat, smoking, stress. <laughs> That's yeah. what's affecting your skin. The topical stuff is amazing. And if you can get a healthy organic product that you put on your skin and it makes you feel good and it's loaded with antioxidants and anti-inflammatory ingredients, that's amazing. But the first thing you should be doing is eating an anti-inflammatory diet is to meditate so you're not stressing all day. 
to remove negative thoughts from your mind, not smoking, not drinking too much. Then you'll get the glow. But everything else is superficial. So you're talking about big, deep-seated changes in the lives of people to, to help them get what they want. But how can we, I mean, people are, are so set in their ways. How could you take someone, let's say, for example, some guy who's 50 years old has been working at a power plant for, for 40 years and tell him like what you want is just to get it, get it by like meditating. Like that guy's going to shoot you <laughs> off like a hippie. How can we effectively communicate a more holistic lifestyle to people without sounding like the dumb hippie that your dad didn't like who lived down the street. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I agree with, with, I think it with usually you. takes a life event. It usually takes a life event. Like somebody gets diagnosed with cancer. We've just had some of these. Heart attack. You know, like it takes a life event. And I've, I've been meeting these people all my life that you would look at them and never expect they do yoga or meditate or eat a plant-based diet, but times are changing. Yeah. Times are changing and people all from all walks of life are having these epiphanies and it's not coming from the same place that that used to come from. It's coming from, there's a movement happening. Like the, the movie that, uh, that just came out a year ago called um, Game Changers. That movie yeah, was specifically yeah, was targeting great. bodybuilders, dudes, yeah, bros. It worked. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. You did, know? did you watch the, the Rogan podcast where they argued through the whole thing? No. Okay, just because there's an argument for everything, right? I mean, always, I, didn't even yes, watch, always. I didn't even watch Game Changers. I was like, I okay. don't need to watch Game you Changers. Heard, you, heard, you heard about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I heard about it. And like all these dudes were coming up to me because they know I'm vegan. They're like, oh, like I watch Game Changers and I'm vegan now. I'm like, cool, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Forget about it, you know? <laughs> like, Forget about it. If you eat a, a, a well-balanced plant-based diet, and when I say well-balanced, that's not to be taken lightly. Most people that go plant-based are eating crappy food. They're eating lots of fake meats. They're eating lots of, they're carb loading. You know, if you can move through that phase, yeah. And the way I tell people to do this, six months, don't buy anything in a package. If you want to truly be plant-based, go six months on a packaging-free diet, and I guarantee you, you will not have any deficiencies because all you're eating are whole foods, whole grains, beans, seeds. The problem is you go to the yeah. store, and you're like, oh, I'm just going to buy this bag of bread and I'm going to buy this fake chicken tenders and this like boxed pizza and tortilla chips and all this shit that you just grab it, open the bag and shove it in your face. Yeah, yeah. You're probably going to have an unbalanced diet and you're going to be that guy who says, Oh, I was plant-based uh, for a year, but I had all these deficiencies and I just had to start eating meat. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I hear you, you've probably heard Those, it a thousand times. Oh, I was yeah. vegan for six years, but then this thing happened. Yes. I have and I'm like, it. well, that thing is generally, generally, not all the time, an unbalanced diet. Do you drink coffee? Yeah, I'm drinking it right now. I'm just curious. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't drink coffee. I, I think my, my diet, I don't know, maybe my energy, I just drink water and eat lots of fruits and vegetables and I'm, and I get plenty of sleep and I feel fine. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a taste guy, so I yeah. actually don't need coffee for energy. Mm -hmm. I just like burnt, smoky things. Fair enough. Right on, yeah. man. Scotch, um, mezcal, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say to someone, including someone like me, who is so you've 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 but you've traveled through your entrepreneurial journey. You've obviously had some great success. Not even an entrepreneurial journey, just someone who's just doesn't have financial means to double their grocery budget by eating organic. I go to Sprouts. I, I look, whatever says 99 cents, that's the fruit I get for the week. Like, and then, and it, it, obviously you're telling me it has all these, these, I knew there was something going on. It has um, pesticides and all sorts of different chemicals. Like I had a raspberry. So I, I door knock and I went to this guy's house and he had a beautiful garden and we were talking about it. He's like, yeah, try some of those raspberries it was like nothing I'd ever tasted in my life. Yeah. Something he grew in his bag. It's like, it goes to show. It's like, wow, it's really different at the store. But what would you, what, what would you say to someone who's just like, I, I can't justify going from, you know, $50 a week to a hundred dollars a week. It's just not feasible for me. It's right very, now. very simple. We'll if you, <laughs> if you don't buy packaged food and when yes. I say packaged food, I mean, nothing in packaging. 
and I, you eat I an or if you eat a vegan organic diet, not in packaging, you will spend less money than if you were eating a meat and package diet. And I did this. I, I like hundred. I a hundred percent agree. It's it's so when you buy something in a package, as a consumer, this is very important to understand. If you buy. Um, and, and a good way of really understanding the impact of this, and there's a video I did on YouTube probably 10 years ago where I take a camera crew into Whole Foods and I show people, if you go to the bulk section mm -hmm. and you buy a pound of beans, yeah. right? Organic beans. That's what I do, yeah. Yeah, and, and if you compare that to buying a can that's in a branded can that were cooked and put into some kind of liquid and then canned and shipped to the store, it's something like, I forget what the multiple is. It's like 18 X the cost of bulk non-branded beans. I don't and know so as a consumer. Yeah. I don't know if consumer, it's that much. Sorry. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot because you're not just paying for the cooking and the processing. You're paying for the branding and that company has to pay for marketing and they have to pay the store to sell their, you know, to print coupons and get people to buy that one can and the branding and the marketing. Whereas like bulk beans usually are going from a farm to the bulk section, <laughs> you know, they're dried out, sold in giant bags. And so I think I figured out that the, a family of four on a no packaging organic vegan diet with tons of food, like massive amounts of food will spend about $72 a week. Hmm. I'm thinking like, where am I going wrong here? Because, because I, I'll tell you right now, I, I eat rice, quinoa, sweet potato, broccoli, Italian squash, kale, and then fruit. But I don't buy organic because it's, it's double the price. So, I mean, I guess well, I'm a rare. You, you got to be buying something else. You're buying the protein powder. That's like the, po the protein bucks. powder is expensive. Um, sriracha sauce. I get, that comes in a package. Mm -hmm. Um, no, no, really, really not. To, it's not, it's not $72. It's like, it's like usually like 35 bucks. And then I'll get like, I get like, um, what's it called? The uh, nutritional yeast stuff as well. You can buy that in bulk. I do buy that in bulk. Yeah. yeah. But, 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 but I mean, this is like a, an outlier. Cause like a, what you're describing is, is very obvious. If you don't buy packaging and you eat meat all the time and you switch to an organic plant-based vegan diet, you will save money. There's no question. Because yeah. you're so right that, that you pay for the branding. And we, it's, it was actually astounding to me to like start buying my own groceries. And then I, tr so I, the, I did a year of buying my own groceries when I was eating meat. And then I transitioned, oh wait, was I even eating meat then? I don't think, I oh, know I've, I've actually never bought my own groceries when, when I was eating meat. Yeah, I never, I never did that. But starting to pay attention to what I purchase and realizing that the healthier food is actually less expensive is like mind blowing. I like a bag of Lay's chips is like $3, but you can get like, you know, what you can get like eight apples for $3. Yeah. And it's just like a huge difference. I yeah. don't know. It, it's, it's just like the stuff that we're marketing is like garbage. And I like see the way what people buy now. And I'm like, wow, I can't believe that so many people are like falling for this stuff. It's just like colorful packaging. Mom used to buy it and then they just keep buying it for their whole yep. life. And it's just, yep. it, it's not, I wouldn't say as far as it's poisoning, but some of the products are like, no, like it's Lay's definitely chips. poisoning. Yeah. It's I don't want, I don't want to be too polar. But <laughs> <laughs> some of it's I mean, pretty, so it's pretty much bad. Of things we consider to be food is not food. Right. Right. Yeah, I think not. Lay's chips are, are a great example of that. They're yeah. like shavings that are salted. I mean, anytime you see some cottonseed oil, you should run the other way. What because is that? Cottonseed oil is what most junk food, like conventional junk food is fried in. And cottonseed oil has a cocktail of toxic chemicals in it because cotton is grown for clothing and they pesticide the shit out of it. <laughs> And so it's the cheapest oil you can buy, which is why when you go to buy potato chips or fried snacky things, almost always at the bottom, it says cottonseed oil. Nasty.
cool. Yeah. So what do you think the role of business is in this fight against climate change versus a like more top down or not even top down, just a more political legislative approach versus startup companies like you showing people how we're going to be different versus, you know, laws coming in and changing the way we, we live? I mean, I'm, I'm part libertarian, so I want to believe that the culture will eventually make better decisions for itself. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's not happening at the speed in which we need it to. And, Correct. you know, I, I just think that people need to become more educated on what they're buying and, and how they're buying it. And my job as a creator, as a founder, as an entrepreneur is just to create the better option. Yeah. So starting next week, when you go to the store in, you know, over a thousand retailers across the country, you're going to see Alpine Provisions, which is an organic Castile soap in aluminum packaging in a sea of plastic mm -hmm. products that are not, not, that are not organic. And so as a consumer, you have now have the decision what, what product you want to buy. As a founder, I did my job of creating a better option. And that's all I can do. That's, that's my, that's my contribution is I am, I am constantly striving to create the best option for the customer. Yeah. Awesome. What, so we need these Instagram influencers to brainwash people into buying your products then, right? Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> who, how are we, we, if we need the change now, it's not happening enough. How, how can we do it? And I don't like the idea of like forcing people to do things, but this is, I don't know, like, how do we, we get need a million adoption? Greta Thunbergs in the world because <laughs> she well, doesn't coming. accept money, but she does she's on, she's an outlier and she's a rarity where she does not accept money to endorse anything. And I think that, huh. you know, the influencer world, it's like, they're, they're making their living off of supporting products, you know? And I would say the amount of influencers out there that, are, you know, that have a hard and fast rule around what they will and will not promote is pretty small. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, they're, they're, it's their job. Like they're out there yeah. to, to, to help move product. And I'm hoping that there is an ocean of new influencers that have super high morals and it's, it's the high road and it's not the most profitable road of saying, um, yes, I will support brands. I get paid for advertising, but here are my, here are my boundaries. Like I'm yeah, not going to support things that I don't believe in. It's, it's interesting. You bring this up close, close to the end here. Cause I did. So I don't know if you're aware I, I, so I'm a realtor, 50% of my profits are donated to fight climate change. So right off the bat, I'm cutting like ha myself in half, uh, which, which, which I've always, I've, Thank you. I, I felt great about it. It's allowed me to have all this energy and believe in what I'm doing. But um, last week, I, I kind of had this, this breakthrough. And I feel like um, this kind of limiting factor, this constraint that I've had on my mind for so many years, just finally just, just sizzled, fizzled away. And I was just thinking critically about my business and where I want where I wanted to go and how I'm going to achieve my goal. And I realized, um, so that 50% to climate change, that was obvious for me. I'm struggling with grappling with what to do with the other 50%. And I wanted to basically hoard it to myself and, and may become very wealthy very quickly. But then I realized that I've just been have having, having so much fun every single day, just connecting with people and doing podcasts like this and becoming a better version of myself. Like I've, like, I'm always like, I need to become financially free. I need to become financially free. I need to be able to do whatever I want with nobody ever to tell me what to do. But I just realized like, I'm already doing that. So like yeah. I, the, the pursuit of this Uber wealth that has been conditioned upon Americans, you should be, you should have a Lamborghini. You should have a giant house. I don't, I know I didn't want a Lamborghini. I didn't want a giant house, but I still was ho holding on to this idea that I need to have millions of dollars like right now. And I just realized I don't. And like the whole world, I feel like has just opened up in front of me since then. And I can do whatever I want with my business. And now I'm, I'm actually leaning towards just reframing the company as a charity and just putting all the work in I'm doing now and just donating a hundred percent of the profits and taking a reasonable salary. But uh, I don't know. I just thought it's interesting. You brought that up because you know, a lot of politicians obviously take a lot of money and influencers take money too. But 
this, this idea, this, these Greta's that you have that you think that there's not a lot of them. I'm going to look for them first off. And second off, I think there are a lot and a lot more people going down this way. Once you've like, Unlo- like released yourself from your conditioning is what I call it and just really live true to yourself I don't think m- money is, is going to be the main motivator moving forward but who knows maybe I'm just kind of a crazy outlier guy no I, I think a lot of what you're saying is correct I think that the gen z that's coming up is looking at the world f- through a completely different lens I'm gen um, z the your gen z yeah so mm-hmm. like the yeah. idea of happiness has completely changed. I mean, we're already seeing like experiences are valued way more than things with your generation, which has always been a drum that I've been beating. I'm like, go out and have experiences. Things are useless. Yeah. You've traveled to many countries at this point. 59. Yeah. 59 countries. And I have seen some of the most happy people in the world that have next to nothing. That's what it is. Yeah. They're just happy because they're doing what they want to do. They believe in what they want to believe. They don't have any guilt. They don't have any regrets. You don't need money to be happy. You need basic things taken care of. Obviously you need food, you need healthcare, you need clothes, you need a roof over your head. But after a certain point, it's diminishing returns. It's like happiness comes from how you live your life. 100% how you see your life as well. If you're, if you're wake up every day and you're satisfied with what you're doing, I don't think anyone can, can come and take that away from you. If you know the actions you take consciously every day, facilitate your own happiness and success the way you see it. I just, it's just like you have control over yourself. And I, I think a lot of people- What is the first question that. you ask yourself when you wake up in the morning? The first question I ask myself, I wake up in the morning. I'm like, fuck yeah, let's go. Let's get it. Cause I'm like a crazy, <laughs> cra- I'm like a crazy entrepreneur guy. Um, I wash my face. I go over. Um, I'd be like, uh, how many, like, I wonder if I have any emails or something is what lately what it's been. <laughs> yeah. I ask myself today, am I going to let the world affect me or am I going to affect the world? Clearly. And, I think we know the so- answer. And I, well, sometimes I lose that battle. It's hard. You know? It's it's a consistent it's hard. fight. But if I ask myself the question and then it's on, it's in my hands to make that decision. And sometimes in the middle of the day, I'm like, I got defeated by the world, but tomorrow that's not going to happen because I saw no. where I went wrong. Learn. And if you wake up in the morning and you have, if you give yourself permission to make that decision more often than not, you're going to live a life that affects the world around you. Hopefully it's in a positive way. <laughs> you have you've been positive for me today, man. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Yeah. Cool. I just wanted to touch on your, your quote before we go, if you want to just explain uh, the fringe predicts the future. I think it's been sprinkled in throughout this whole conversation, but what, what does that really mean? What it means is you can look back to the beginning of recordable human history and anything that was considered crazy or cutting edge or far left becomes the norm. You know, to me, like, and and I'm not specifically talking about politics. I'm just talking about like our general view of the world. Like everything that is seems so crazy and left and too liberal becomes so common later on. Mm -hmm. Now I remember like, uh, I think it was like 1989, I pierced my ear. Mm-hmm. you know, with a, with two ice cubes and a pin in the, in the bathroom. <laughs> and it was back then it was like, so crazy. Like people wouldn't hire me cause I had an earring or they would tell me I had to take it off. And I'd be like, no, I'm not taking it off. This is, I want an earring. Who cares? Girls yeah. wear earrings. I got For an real. earring, you know? And then nowadays, I mean, you would be hard pressed to find an employer who gives two shits if a guy has an earring or a nose. No kidding. And People are just constantly fighting change, right? There's a it's a natural instinct. It's about fear. Yeah, it's about fear, and like the organic industry used to be this crazy granola hippie thing, and now it's everywhere, Mm -hmm. right? And you see it with (laughs) with everything. I mean, everything. You can't look in any direction and see something that is considered crazy leftist, blah blah blah. And 
flash forward 10, 5, 20 years from now, and it's just normal. It's normalized. Yeah. And so I feel like people spend their lives fighting change mm -hmm. for the wrong reasons. And you got to embrace it. I want, yeah, I mean, it's okay to have ideals and concepts and morals around certain things. But so many things that we fight, it's just, it's just like a useless fight. Like the earring thing was, or long hair. You know, in the 60s, everyone started growing long hair and every, you know, it was like frowned upon. And I'm like, 200 years ago, the people that founded the country had long hair, but all of a sudden it's not okay. And like, you know, and now it's like what I've been watching re recently is like older generations or even like younger generations fighting sexual identity. Mm -hmm. It's fear. I'm like, why do you give two shits how someone wants to identify themselves? It's, it's about when it gets life. pushed on. It's about when it gets pushed on how you have to live your life is when, when the, the fight will come in, I would think. But it's like telling it you how to address someone, I think. Yeah. And it doesn't, doesn't have to affect someone. It's just like, it's my view is like, this is your life, right? Mm -hmm. And as far as we know, you have one life. You should sure. be able to live it any way you want as long as you are not destroying other people's lives. That's an American way of looking at things. That's for sure. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's an American way. It's like, it's just like, Hey, <laughs> it's freedom from you, interference. Yeah. Like live your life the way you want to live it. Just don't, don't be a dick. <laughs> don't be a dick. It's the classic. Don't be a dick. It's, it's the, the, golden <laughs> the golden nice. rule. The golden rule. Joshua said, just don't be a dickhead guys. Don't be a it's dick. simple. <laughs> it's not the heart. Well, well, Joshua, I mean, this was great. Thank you so much for coming on here. I really appreciate you giving me some time. It was a, a true pleasure. My pleasure. It was great being here. All right. And we'll, we'll talk again sometime in the future. All right, man. All right. Take it easy. Take it easy, man.